pretty, we think we have some pretty great ideas that we're going to share today. We're going to defer to you on anything too technical, if that's okay with you. That sounds great. And, okay. <laughs> All right. So um, everybody, you want to introduce yourselves? Um, I'm Michelle. I work with the high school team. Go ahead, Drew. I saw you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Drew Courtney. I'm also uh, working with the high schools. All right. Let's go middle school. I am Molly Lang. I'm one of the middle school EL resource teachers. And I don't see Elizabeth yet. Is Elizabeth here? Hmm. I don't think she's in yet. So we'll do one more. <laughs> and then I'm Amy Whitehead. I'm with elementary. So uh, our presentation today, what we were really thinking about is you know, we know that when English learners feel comfortable and when we scaffold their instruction, that they're gonna do great things and they can really achieve at high levels. So we're gonna share some things you can do that are in Microsoft Teams and then some things that are just great instructional and emotional scaffolds. Does that sound good, Matt? Mm -hmm. I am super excited. I always love when you all <laughs> present, so it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> I I love working with your bride over at Iroquois. She's amazing. Oh. She really likes you too. Every time she works with me, she's like, oh, just, I just love Michelle Shorey. She's awesome. Mary's <laughs> fun. fun. All right. So I'm going to share. And let's see. So I've got my button up here, three dots, mm -hmm. share screen. And let's see. You guys have a screen? Yep. You're there. All right. I'm going to hide that. I hate seeing that. And because you guys are awesome, you always remind us to turn on the captions. Yes. So you all are pros um, now. We don't need to remind anybody anymore. <laughs> so have you ever done this in PowerPoint? Um, so I think it's at the bottom left in PowerPoint, isn't it? Is that right? Yeah. And do you know in PowerPoint, you can do different languages? I did not know that. That's awesome. Yeah. We might have time to show you today. So we'll show you. All right. So we'll get started. So these are the things we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about accessibility features in Microsoft. We're also going to talk about Teams features for English learners. We'll hit on synchronous tips for English learners because really it's not just about the tech. We all know that, right? It's about the pedagogy of how do we design instruction online. We'll talk about some emotional uh, supports in synchronous learning and then instructional supports for L's and English, English uh, with English learners. And then finally, how can you contact us for support? We have a lot going on. We, we have a lot of trainings. We want to tell you what's going on with us. So first of all, we want to tell you that it doesn't need to be about Google or Microsoft. We think that when you use Google and Microsoft together, it's awesome. So I want to show you, um, Matt, do you know Irina McGrath? I do. Yes. So she's my partner in crime, and we have this little website that we do on this just for fun. It's called the ELL 2.0. And this summer, we did a conference, and we actually looked at all the accessibility features in Google and Microsoft, and we wanted to compare them so people could see, you know, the different languages. Uh, Google has a lot more languages, but Microsoft has the immersive reader, which is just amazing. And so when we did a side-by-side -side of Meet and Teams, we saw that they're essentially the same. You know, you have the same captioning in English, you can record meetings, but the big difference is that if we get more um, functionality with Microsoft Teams, if we can use that immersive reader, that's gonna be really powerful mm -hmm. for our kids. Um, and so immersive reader, I wanna show you quick. I know we've done a show on this before, but basically if you go to office.com and you use the online version of Microsoft Word, you can go ahead and go to view after you type something and click immersive reader. And then you have this set of tools. And so if you are an English teacher, you can go ahead and click on grammar options. And this is such a highly visual tool that this would be great to use in distance learning because you can show kids nouns, adjectives, verbs, et cetera. But we, what we really like in the ESL world is that you can go over to this little book and you can translate it. And so make sure you click document and that's gonna translate everything. Here's the amazing part. If you click this arrow, 
you get a read aloud so students can have the text read aloud to them. So one of the things we should be doing during NTI is showing kids how to use immersive reader. This is a really powerful tool. And I know during NTI 1.0, we showed how to use Office Lens and that kids can just have that app on their phones. So now digging into, oops, now digging into just Microsoft Teams, we wanted to see, you know, what, um, what accessibility features are there for English learners. The first one for sure would be gallery view. If you speak another language, watching a person's face is super helpful. And so with English learners, they might be shy, they might not want to show their faces, and we would definitely encourage teachers to think about that, about whether students need to show their faces or not, especially for some of our, uh, especially for some of our Muslim girls, that is not going to be comfortable for them to show their faces. Most of them don't wear their hijabs at home. So thinking about that gallery view, that's going to be really essential. And I know we have to do a little updating to get that. Um, but that gallery view is going to help us if kids feel comfortable showing their faces, but definitely if they can see the teacher's face, that's going to be really helpful for them in comprehending. Another thing that's really going to support English learners in Microsoft Teams is closed captioning. When kids see captions, that helps them match the words with what they're hearing. That really, really helps with attention and focus, but it also supports those developing readers. And I'm a French teacher as well. And one of the things that helps me when I watch French movies is if I can watch, if I can turn on those subtitles in French, that really increases my comprehension when I can see what I'm hearing because it's usually just a little too fast for me. Uh, so thinking about distance teaching, what we wanna really think about is um, that talk. We want to reduce the amount of teacher talk that we have because we don't want to just fill the space with that, that talk. We want to think about students engaging in dialogue because we know that when kids are talking, learning increases. We know this from Hattie. Look at that. Um, 0 0.82. 0 0.4 is really good, but 0.82 is amazing. So if students are engaged in discussions, that's going to be really good. So think about your synchronous sessions as a time for kids to talk and for a, kid, a time for kids to do um, the learning and for teachers, you know, to back off a little bit. So thinking about ways we can get our kids talking and us talking a little bit less. Have you read this book, Matt? I haven't. I've seen so many people on social media talk about it, but I haven't had a chance to pick it up yet. It's really good. I highly recommend it. It's got lots of ideas for, you know, synchronous mm -hmm. instruction because it is different, right? When you have just a precious few hours a week, you really want to make the most of it and think about how you can get kids talking. Um, your uh, your closed captions are off, by the way, just as just to oh. Know. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. When I hit percent, yeah, I'll turn back on. There we go. Um, another thing we want to think about with that synchronous time is, you know, a lot of our kids come from collectivist cultures where it's really important for them to work together. Um, as Americans, we're in a very individualistic culture where we don't mind working alone, but we really want to have opportunities for our kids to uh, build community and work together. Drew Courtney and I taught summer school together, Molly taught two on our team, and we saw that kids really, really enjoy learning and working together. You can also have interaction. Think about opportunities for kids to interact with each other. We really want to increase discussion. As we saw, there's a really high effect size for learning with that. And of course, we're going to have direct instruction. We're going to show kids how to do things, but we want to incorporate some sort of activity every three minutes, whether it's a quick gesture, whether it's a quick um, head nod, hand raising, something. And then we're really looking forward to when we get breakouts, hopefully we'll get breakouts, that we can start doing things like jigsaw and grouping, which have a huge effect on student learning. And so now Drew is going to talk about what we want to avoid. Yep, so when we are doing your synchronous lessons, a couple things that you do want to try to avoid um, is definitely the lecturing without any interaction. So if you have a 30 minute synchronous lesson that's going on, uh, try not to be talking for all 30 minutes because we all know too that usually the focus, we, we lose kids during that just lecturing. So even if you do have to go over a lot of instruction, at least kind of do th those pauses where like give them a thumbs up or a gesture or something just so that way it kind of breaks up the instruction a little bit. 
Um, the other thing we also say to try to avoid is reviewing assignments. Um, we think that that's best if you use a screencast for it, um, because then also uh, screencasts are great because you can post it and kids can go back and rewatch it. So if they're confused, they can always go back, pause it, rewatch, and can get the instructions that way. And if you need some um, tips or tricks for doing screencasts, um, I think an awesome group did a uh, show about a couple weeks ago about screencasts, and that is somewhere on YouTube that you guys can watch. So now um, I'll turn it over to Amy, who's going to talk about some emotional supports. Thanks, Drew. So no matter what the educational setting or what video conferencing tool you're using, the most important part of teaching, and I think we can all agree, is that relationship and community building. And um, one of the gurus in second language acquisition, Stephen Krashen, talks about something called the affective filter. And basically what that means is that when students are learning a new language and they feel unsure or anxious, their comprehension of the new language is much lower. So we want to do everything we can to make them feel safe and welcomed. And one great way to do that is something very simple, such as taking the time to get to know how to pronounce their name. And I think um, our specialist, Vomini, is in the chat, and she's going to put in there for you a link um, to a website to uh, that you can use. If you're not sure how to say a kid's name, you can just type their name in there, and it will actually pronounce it for you so that you can practice, so that you don't find yourself maybe constantly asking the kid during a class call, um, how do you say your name again? Although they might appreciate that, if you can do it another time, that will make them feel very welcome. Um, and then just anything you can do to make them see that you value their culture is going to make them feel safe. The next suggestion we have is having something up already shared in the meeting. Uh, Vomini is also going to put in the chat a link to classroom screen. We really love this for English learners because as you can see here on this example, you can put um, some text up there that might include the icebreaker question um, or a checklist or here are the things you need when class starts. It also has on their work symbols, such as silence as you enter, you could have the timer going so they know class is going to start in about five minutes. You can also see some of the other work symbols along there on the bottom. Um, you can change the background to match whatever theme it is you might be covering in that particular session or if you're a content teacher, using something that goes along with your content. Um, there are, you can do random name, you know, groupings. There's just, there's so much to be done with classroom screen um, for synchronous lessons and distance learning and also really face-to-face -face as well. So we love, love, love this tool um, to engage in making them feel safe. They know what to expect. They know what's coming. Hey, okay. yes, ma'am. Have you ever tried the sound level when we're actually in class? I have actually, it's really <laughs> cool. <laughs> I love that one. Yeah, that, that one's is. great. Okay. Okay, and yes. The next thing we really love for English learners is that hand raise feature. So we thought that this could be a non-threatening way to encourage participation and to teach them how to use the feature. So um, we thought of a little a game. It could be something like, and I'm thinking of probably more like primary kids, but raise your hand if you like cats. And then you teach them how to click on the hand to actually you know, indicate yes, that they do. And the teacher can say, oh, I see that Samantha loves cats. And you could also even take it a step further and add sentence frames with it to have them prepare to answer that question verbally um, if that's where you are in the relationships with your class where they feel comfortable doing that. Um, the next thing with this hand raise feature that we love is sort of incorporating it into your digital classroom management. So once you've taught them how to use the feature, you can set it as an expectation for signaling with the hand raise that you are ready to answer this question and the teacher can unmute you or the teacher can tell them to unmute. Um, so one way to really structure that interaction with this feature that we really love is called Q triple S A. So you pose the question 
just like I did with the raise your hand if, you give them the STEM where they actually can see how to answer the question. They are prepared. They can rehearse it themselves with the microphone off if need be. They signal with the hand raise. Yes, I, I'm prepared to answer this question. And then that way they know that no matter who they call on, um, they're, they're prepared and ready to answer. And then you can quickly assess whether or not the kids were um, really understood whatever the question was. So that can be really fun and made into a game, or you can really attach it to content as they get to know that particular strategy. Okay. And another feature that we love for thinking about social emotional supports is because this lobby is enabled anyhow with the, with the meeting features, um, you could take it as an opportunity to, for a couple, a couple ways. So you could make it a goal to meet with every single kid one on one before the meeting starts. So you see your kids coming into the lobby and you say, I want to meet with Adam today. So you let Adam in first and you just really quickly have a quick chat with him before you let everyone else in. Maybe there's a student who you're kind of concerned about and you just want to check in with them really quickly before the group gets going to just see if there's anything they need. Um, or it could be maybe I'm thinking of secondary that as we get used to this platform, you're going to maybe have a student present. So you let them in and check with them. Do you have your presentation ready? Do you need any help? Do you have any questions about what it is today? Or on the flip side, just prepping a student, I'm going to pose this question when everybody comes in and I want you to be the first one to answer. Let's practice. So it just gives you just really limitless opportunities to check in with kids one-on-one -on -one before you start the whole group session. And I believe Drew is going to take us to discuss instructional supports. Yeah, uh, so now some ideas that we want to share when you're having those synchronous lessons. Um, we, we kind of want to share some ideas that we've got for English learners to help them um, academically and instructionally. So really when we think of the types of scaffolds that we like to use, um, I love this visual. Um, and I believe Bomni is going to put um, the link to this visual in the chat. And when we think about forms of scaffold, really we want to think with our English learners as there's three big ones. We have the sensory, the interactive, and then the graphic um, scaffold. So for sensory, providing illustrations, finding videos, um, real life objects um, to really reinforce um, your lessons. The interactive piece is crucial. Of course, we want kids to be talking. So whether it is pairs, small groups, whole language, even using the home language um, is a great form of um, interaction with our students. And then our last thing is our graphics. So having charts, tables, infographics, we just need something that our kids can see. So when we kind of think about what to do during your synchronous lessons, one simple way, and Amy kind of talked about this, is just to do simple gestures. So if you're presenting a lesson and you want to see thumbs up, thumbs down, okay, it's a very non-threatening way for our English learners to kind of say, hey, I get it, or no, I think I, I need to review this a little bit more. Um, another way that you can is by using, um, this will have a little more prep to it, but if you could have the kids create like colored cards, so we just said like green, yellow, red, um, and there's a uh, tons and tons of ideas that you can use this for where you can use them as like, hold up, yes, or hold up green for yes and red for no. So again, another like non-threatening way for students to interact with your lesson. Um, you can do them as true, false. You can kind of do them as informal checks. I like to call these like pulse checks. So if you're in the middle of a lesson, kind of be like, okay, how are you guys feeling? Green's good. Yellow means we need to go over this a little bit more or red is I'm really lost and confused. Um, it's also great for icebreakers too. Kind of like getting like a, like see how your mood is. Green, you're good. Yellow, you're so-so. Red, you're like, oh, it's Monday again, um, type of a way. But it's a great kind of simple, kind of check in that you can do um, with your students. So what do you guys think if we didn't, you know, we don't get kids these cards, what is a way that we could work around this? I'm thinking that kids could just color a card, perhaps like a, a um, an index card with different colored crayons or markers. Amy, what do you think on the elementary side? How could we support kids with this? 
Well, I like the suggestion you just made. Um, I know a lot of elementary schools were sending home supplies with kids to make sure that they had, you know, like crayons. So, I mean, it could even be where the teacher says, I want you to go find three things in your house, one green, one yellow, one red. And then that could be something that they use to hold up if they don't have, you know, an actual card. It could be items. Um, and that's a good way for, you know, for the littles to make sure you can check in that they know their colors. Love it. And you're incorporating movement. And I'm thinking at a secondary level, I don't know, uh, Elizabeth or Molly chime in, but I'm thinking a simple yes, no card might even work here too. That could definitely work as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, in Teams, um, another great feature that um, Microsoft has is the ability to turn on captions. So they are available in the app for Microsoft Teams. Um, there is a little like, I think, believe it's like three dots. And if you click on that, you'll see where it says turn on live captions. Um, they are in English. But again, they do provide a graphic support, kind of like how Michelle said earlier, it's kind of nice because I was a Spanish teacher. When I was listening to stuff in Spanish, it is nice to have the captions of them speaking it because it does help me with my comprehension because sometimes, you know, they do speak fast. Um, and same thing with our English learners too. If we have the, they have the captions on, they'd be able to comprehend what's being said as well. Um, the only thing is that the students will have to turn them on. So that could be something that maybe the first synchronous lesson you have to kind of teach them where it is they can turn on the captions and just practice with it. But it's a feature that the students will have to turn on themselves. I remember in NTI 1.0, we all got so excited because we saw the captions in Google Meet, but we didn't realize the kids couldn't see them, that the user has to enable them. So that's a great catch, Drew. And another great feature, if you use PowerPoint, um, I know that we are all in the world of Google, but PowerPoint also, now we're kind of like, we're kind of both words now, we're in Google and Microsoft, but um, PowerPoint does have the ability to turn on captions in different languages. So if you go to, you have to do the office.com. Um, if you go on the PowerPoint, if you go to slideshow, you will see Michelle's on here where it says always use subtitles. We click the little drop down box. You can say the spoken language, of course, we be English, but then the subtitle language, you can change it to multiple different languages. Now, take this with uh, when we when we say this, there only one language will be shown for the subtitles. Um, so it'd be great if you have, you know, if you have a, gl a class and, you know, most of them do speak Spanish, that could be helpful. But we also don't want, we also want you to remember that there might be other students in your class as well who speak a different language. So try not to exclude them with the subtitles, but it is a great um, tool to use if you do need some different languages um, in your class. And now um, I want to turn it over to Molly, who's going to explain about the whiteboard, or Elizabeth, excuse me, sorry, <laughs> Elizabeth. That's okay. Okay, so now that we've jumped into this world of Microsoft Teams, we have some new features that we can play with. So one of those is this Microsoft whiteboard. You can access this through your share tray. So it's in the same spot where you would go to share your screen with your class. You can choose to share a whiteboard. This is very similar to Jamboard, which I know a lot of people have started using um, from the Google interface. But um, the whiteboard is just a little bit different. So you have options. You can use markers. You can add a text box and you can have a post-it note. You do not have the option to add images on Microsoft Whiteboard. Um, but this is a great tool that we can use to have the sensory interactive and graphic scaffolds that Drew was talking about a little bit earlier. A couple of things to take note of, though, you cannot change the sharing settings at this time. So anyone who is in your team will have the ability to add and delete from your whiteboard. 
Um, another important thing to note is that if you go to this little settings wheel, you can save, or I'm sorry, you can export this image. So if you want to save the work that you've done with your class, you can do that through there. Um, and one little like workaround that we've figured out while we don't have chat features, while we're waiting for that to be enabled, you can add links to your Jamboard or to your whiteboard. So if there's a link you want your students to access, you do have to use the keyboard controls. So you have to use control C to copy and then control V and you can paste it into a text box and then share links with your students that way. So now we're going to talk about Jamboard. So Jamboard is kind of like the Google equivalent to the Microsoft whiteboard. Jamboard is a little bit different in that you can change the sharing settings. So if you want to just demonstrate something for your students, you can set your sharing settings to view only, and then they will not have the ability to manipulate anything. If you want collaboration, you can change the sharing settings to give anyone with the link the ability to edit. So one really great thing that we've liked to do on Jamboards um, is you can add multiple pages. So maybe your first page is instructions or something like this that, you know, to check in with your kids. And then on the next pages, they can collaborate to brainstorm. They could work in groups. Um, it's just a really great collaborative tool. And I think that's really all we have to say about Jamboard. So now Molly is going to jump in and finish up. Thank you, Elizabeth. So I know some of us are really missing that chat feature that we had in Google Meets that we don't have yet, like Elizabeth mentioned, here in Microsoft Teams. Um, especially for L's, maybe they're not ready to speak out yet using their microphone and they'd much prefer to type. So one workaround we have for that is the Q&A feature that's already in Google Slides. So if the slides for your synchronous lesson are made in Google Slides, you can click um, the Q&A, you would start new. And if you want, you can make this dialog box large um like full screen and then you can slide this over to kind of make it half and half and as you see there on the left you have your presentation and across the top it says ask a question and it gives the link if your students go to that link in a new tab they're able to type in questions during your presentation that will pop up over here in the right so that is one workaround we have that would make it appear like a chat feature um, if you are someone who wants your students to be able to ask questions, but maybe you don't want those popping up for the rest of your class to see, you can still enable the Q&A feature. It will give you that code there across the top. Um, but then you can, I think, close out of that, or you can put it up in a new tab so that then students are still able to ask questions but they're not showing up for everyone to see and instead you can come and view them at the end and you can discuss them at the end or you can address those questions with your students individually kind of one-on-one -on -one after your presentation is over so that is the q a feature in google slides if you click that link it'll take you to this page so if I'm back here, I'm displaying this for my students to see. And if I go to that link, that is where their questions will appear. And that is also what students will see when they type in a question. So that is a workaround to kind of have that chat feature still available to you during your synchronous lessons. And then one final thing we wanted to talk about today is the ability to record your meetings in Microsoft Teams. So we recommend that first you turn off incoming video so that kind of protects the privacy of your students and then you can start recording. When you are finished and you end the session or end the meeting, it will save it in your Microsoft Teams app 
And then you can download that to your computer as an MP4 and upload that then to your Google Classroom for students who may be missed the session. This will, of course, give them the power of pause so they can listen and re-listen to things that you say, take notes, maybe open Google Translate to the side and kind of work on translating some important concepts on, your, on their own. So that is a feature that we really like for ELLs as well, because a lot of times, even if they made the original meeting, they like to come back and watch it later using the power of pause. So if you need help, we love supporting you. The hashtag we use on Twitter is JCPSESL. So please type that and all the awesome stuff you're doing to support L's in your classroom. And also if you need support from us, we have office hours set up. So reach out to us if you wanna schedule some one-on-one -on -one time for support. For PD, we have some Back by Popular Demand modules that we offered this summer that are in the works of being put back on PD Central. These are asynchronous modules that cover a wide variety of topics having to deal with ESL. So be looking out for those on PD Central. You can work at your own pace. You can do one of them or you can do all of them. That is completely your choice. We are also in the process of creating some PD for content teachers that will go through the eight key practices for working with and supporting your L's. So we will communicate that out to you all when that is created as well. And we also have Appy Hour or our Lunch and Learn starting tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. Quick 15 minute sessions that talk about different tools that you can use with L's during this digital learning and we'll communicate that via Twitter as well. So be on the lookout for those. So were there any questions in the chat or anything we, do you have any questions, Matt, for us or? Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, some of the questions in the chat were just to uh, paste some of those links in there. So I, I put your presentation in and I also put in um, pronouncenames.com and classroomscreen.com for everybody as well, so. Great. Well, we appreciate it. We love that you give us an opportunity to share. This is a great way for us to reach so many people, and we love working with you. And thanks for all that you're doing with Teams. It's amazing. Oh, thank you all. You guys always share so many awesome resources. I always learn something. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Matt.